I've done a few slides, just this is my format, my YouTube show, so I kind of stuck with that. So I'll give you a bit of an intro of who I am, and then I'll show you some of my projects. So I'm Kevin McAleer. I make videos on YouTube. I also have a, a couple of websites where I host um, some of my robotic projects. And every single week, um, seven o'clock on Sunday evening, uh, UK time, so we're in BST now, uh, I'll do a, a, about an hour live show. Sometimes it goes about an hour and a half. <laughs> and I'll just kind of show people something that might be an element of um, teaching in there as well. And it's usually around Raspberry Pis. It's around um, MicroPython, regular Python, and usually robotics as well. So let me get into it then. So the first project um, I want to share with you today is Clustered Pi. So I built a Raspberry Pi cluster, as probably many people will do. A bit hard to get hold of them at the moment, but um, I understand that we've, the Raspberry Pis will be a bit more available the sort of second half of the year. Um, and I bought these um, quite a while ago, and I've, I've upgraded the cluster as new um, boards have become available. So it's currently got four Raspberry Pi 4s. Uh, they're all running the 64-bit version OS, and it hosts my website. It, it hosts it via Docker. So each, each uh, web server is built by just grabbing some code from GitHub, which it uses Jekyll to uh, build the, the web pages from Markdown. So it's like a really slick um, process. It's very easy for me to sort of create a blog entry or upload a project and just have it all rebuild overnight and uh, publish it. And uh, one of the nodes is like a load balancer using Nginx so that uh, when you hit the site, it's actually hosting just behind me in the, uh, I think, where is it? Just there. That's where the uh, the clustered Pi actually lives. Now, I did actually do a different version of the clustered Pi, one I took with me to the uh, um, National Museum of Computing down in Milton Keynes. And uh, that was a, a Cray 1 style um, mini supercomputer, and it has 12 Raspberry Pi zeros in it. So that's what you can see, sort of the top half of the screen there. I've taken that one apart actually at the moment. So that's where sort of in storage in a box. It wasn't very practical, um, mainly because all the uh, computers were using Wi-Fi. And if you have like 12 computers all broadcasting Wi-Fi in a very small area, it doesn't work fantastically well. So I thought I'll just stick with the, the Raspberry Pi 4s. I've actually got a second cluster just in the other part of the room, um, which has got basically the same again. And I use that as a, as a sort of prototyping and experimental thing. So, so yeah, it's made up of uh, four Raspberry Pis, uh, all connected together, a little hub. And um, if you want to check that out, it's a it's uh, www.clustered-pi.com and there's all the write-ups there about how to do it, what all the scripts are, all the Ansible scripts and all that kind of stuff to, to build your own. So that's the first one. Next up is a, a really fun project. When the Raspberry Pi uh, Pico W came out, there were loads of people doing uh, projects where they make like an LED flash and you could control it over Wi-Fi. And I was thinking, how can you take that to like the next level? So I, I had this big mouth Billy Bass fish um, on the shelf and um, I thought maybe I can hack that. So I basically just took the back off and there was a very simple circuit board in there. And I think there's like three or four motors in there. I think it's three motors, one for the mouth, one for the sort of head movement and one for the tail. And they're just DC motors. I think they use about like six volts or something like that to sort of just power them. They don't use any kind of fancy PWM. They basically just force against something and they just stay there. So it's not very efficient as a, as a mechanism. And uh, I basically just got two cheap H bridges and a Raspberry Pi Pico W um, hooked it all up and you can control this um, over the web. So I've actually not got it powered up, but you can actually access the Pico that's hosting the website right now. Uh, if you go to mouthpi.co, you'll find that the, the web page there and you can sort of move the, the mouth open and closed. And what I've done, I've kind of cheated a little bit there because um, there's, a, there's several pictures. I think I had to work out how many, was it eight different photographs I need for the different states. So there's like the head open, the head closed, the tail open, the tail closed, um, and um, mouth open, mouth closed, and head out, head in. So each of those different states, this, there's eight different photographs. So I took them, I made it, depending on which button you click, it will give you the correct picture. So just so it's not flapping all the time in the studio and just wearing out the motors in there. But that was like a really fun project to do. And it brings to life, you know, MicroPython hosting a website on the internet with MicroPython. That's just insane. That It's still surprising me today that you can actually do that. So it was kind of a proof of concept. And it's one of those scary projects where you think, can I really do this? Or is it going to be lots of magic smoke as I, as I get this thing sort of hacked together? But it worked fine. 
Um, I originally had it connected to like a nine volt battery, but it would eat through a nine volt battery in about half an hour just because the motors are so hungry. Uh, but that was a really, really fun one to do. And um, occasionally I do have to sort of um, unplug it and plug it back in just because there's like a log file that gets filled up and the the, the software I'm using that Pimroni wrote called Few, um, it, the version that's on there didn't overwrite like a round robin of the log files. So it would just basically use up all the space and then crash. So but every three months I just need to sort of unplug it, <laughs> wipe the log file and plug it back in and it's fine. I could probably... Uh, reprogram that but I just it's easier just to to do that so that's the big mouth billy bass fish project uh, the next one then is a simple robot arm I've actually got it next to me here so this one is um, a tiny little um, robot arm you can get the files I didn't design this one I just got this one off uh, Thingiverse uh, so I think it's got uh, one two three four five uh, degrees of freedom and it has uh, the Pimroni Inventor 2040, which is um, a little board they produce, which has um, uh, a Pico on board. So it's got a Pico W sort of slapped in the middle of the board there. But it's got a whole bunch of headers um, for servo. So it's really easy to sort of program. You don't have to worry about power management and stuff like that. It, it basically just works. So again, using uh, MicroPython to control this. And this one also uses Few, which is the Pimroni website software that you can just easily connect up on your, your Pico W and then make it host a website. So you can actually have these like sliders you can move around and it will make the arm move depending on what the slider positions are. So again, just a simple concept. And I thought I haven't built a robot arm. I want to build one. So this was my first attempt at it. It's not fantastic, but um, it was a lot of fun to do. So that's the, uh, the robot arm. So next up, we have a uh, Burgerbot. So Burgerbot over here. I've actually built two of these now. So Burgerbot is a 3D printed robot. Uh, I designed this in Fusion 360 and it has a, a Sharpie pen that just sort of goes in the, the top there. And there's a really nice little mechanism on the side that you can probably just about make out there. So there's a simple servo and uh, the servo just moves with those sort of teeth up and down and the pen moves up and down. And uh, it's just got two wheels on it hasn't actually got um, sort of um, casters on there. These are just like little 3D printed sort of stubs that uh, stop it from falling over. And inside it's got Raspberry Pi Pico W. So again, you can control this via the um, by its self-hosted website. It has the, uh, the Pimroni Galleon battery, which is a, a LiPo battery, which is um, 400 mAh, but it's in a little hard case. So they're quite robust, um, they're quite well protected. This also has some other bits and pieces from Pimroni in there. Um, it has the uh, the LiPo um, shim, I think it's called. Uh, so you can basically just power um, the battery, um, power the Pico via that battery, just using this LiPo shim, it just goes over the, the pins of the Pico. And there's also a motor shim as well for controlling the, the two motors. So very, very simple. And it also has the, the range finder on there as well. So the, uh, the ultrasonic, range finder. I use this in a lot of my projects, so you probably see uh, this quite a bit. And there are two types of these ultrasonic range finders. I bought a whole bunch of them, probably about 20 of them, which are all 5 volt only. And obviously the Pico and a lot of microcontrollers are all 3.3 volts. So you either have to just uh, drop it down with like a voltage converter, a voltage divider, like a 2K and a 1K um, should probably do it. And then, um, or you can just buy new ones, which are 3.3 volt tolerant. So uh, a lot of fun with that. And I've had quite a few instant, like uh, educational um, places sort of reach out to me about this one. Uh, they really like this because it's, it's quite affordable for a school to sort of build one of these and they're quite fun to put together. And it's designed to be, you know, as cheap as possible, uh, but also as fun as possible. So yeah, Raspberry Pi Pico W powered, has its own self-hosted website. I've made it as close as possible to Logo, if you ever remember Logo from back in the day when we used to do like uh, BBC computers and stuff. So you can move it forward, rotate it 90 degrees and all that. The rotating it 90 degrees is a little bit hit and miss because the wheels can slip. It doesn't have like an IMU for exact positioning uh, and it depends how, how you know, what the surface is and how accurate that is. But it's, it's kind of good enough really for, for the price, I guess. Um, and the, the pen attachment works quite well. There was a bit of a foobar when I designed this. Um, the five volts that when you put a USB cable in is the thing that powers the, the servo. So I probably need to rejig the electronics a little bit so that when it's not plugged into a USB cable, it can still make the pen move up and down. But um, I think Rory um, from 
uh, Jersey IT, he has um, a laser cut version of this, and they're using that in their in their school, which is pretty cool. So that's that's what I call burger bots because it's kind of the shape of a <laughs> a burger. Uh, what else do we got? So next up is the uh, the Ghostbusters Wi-Fi scanner. So again, when the um, when the Pico W came out, and I was thinking about what kind of projects can we make with this. Um, I thought it'd be really fun to be able to scan for Wi-Fi hotspots and see what the signal strength is. You know, I could check out all my neighbors' Wi-Fi signals and so on. It's just actually quite a practical device. I've not actually got the battery charged up on this one at the moment, but I'll show you this uh, a bit closer. So there's, um, there's a Pimroni Display Pack 2 on there. Um, there is a servo inside, and there's a nice little mechanism that when you, you move one arm, it moves the other one, and it's just like a very simple um, mechanism there. You can see the... Uh, the servo sticking out a little bit then, a bit of blue tack to sort of kind of hide the cables. This also has the Gallium battery inside. It has the Amigo Pro, which is a Pimroni LiPo charger. Um, and it means you can charge the battery while you're using it and so on. And there's a Pico W just behind that screen there. But yeah, it's kind of in the Ghostbusters style. So the idea is when you select using these little buttons up and down, you can move up and down a list of all the different Wi-Fi hotspots and it will move these arms correctly like that. So this was loads of fun to design because it's uh, I love designing stuff in Fusion 360, printing them out on my uh, Ender 2, Ender 3 Pro and Ender 3 version 2, got two printers. And uh, yeah, I've just about got those dialed in now and I understand how to use them just about enough to be able to sort of produce things reasonably quickly. Another thing that I did, I've not actually got it on my slides, um, but this was a little project I did for Halloween and it's like a, a ghost detector i don't believe in ghosts myself but uh, i thought this would be a really fun thing to do and it's got like a little screen on it there and it, it randomly displays words on a little ouija board on the other uh, thing there and it's got these like fun um uh, what they're called uh, living flame um led things and uh, it's in a little 3d printed box and there's like a nice clunky on off switch on there as well but it's quite a nice chunky little thing i was really happy with how that came out so again, that's just a P code W running a bit of MicroPython. Uh, let's go back over to slides here. We've got a couple more to show you. Um, so one I did last, um, was it last October? Um, so where I live up north, we have a, we're not too far from Blackpool and Blackpool is famous for its uh, illuminations. So every, I think it's September to about December or January, they have these illuminations on, on the tower and on the promenade. And uh, you'll see like people on motorbikes that are cars and they're all sort of jazzed up with LEDs. And I thought I need to do this with my little chihuahua. So I, I designed this dog coat with LED strips on it. I had to cut the strips, solder them all together, put them on kind of like a flexible coat. I don't think I've actually got the coat actually it's somewhere around. And um, I designed this little, um, it looks like a little arch, a little bridge for the uh, all the components to go on. So there's a plasma 2040 from Pimroni to, to plug into the LED strips. There is then a regular, a regular Raspberry Pi Pico W, and then there's like a UART bridge between the two of them. So you can control the Plasma 2040 from the Pico W using MicroPython. That can host a website. You can go to your phone, type in text, and it'll scroll the text and everything like that. Um, and again, that's got the little Gallium batteries. They last quite a long time, um, probably about half an hour to an hour. So I had a pocket full of them just in case I needed to swap them out. And I did quite a bit of testing to make sure that the LEDs didn't get hot. So I didn't cook my chihuahua. <laughs> that wouldn't be fun. Uh, but this this drew loads of attention. It was one of those sort of like, oh, what's going on here? Kind of uh, things when we're walking about. So really, really enjoyed putting that one together. And again, it was a, it was out of my comfort zone, sticking things together, hot gluing things, trying to figure out how to make this just physically work. And then working out like the algorithm so that the... The, the LED strips don't kind of, they kind of snake like an, like a radiator kind of configuration, like a snake. So to try and figure out where one pixel is, you've got to kind of figure out what column it is and then either add or take away the number of rows that there are per column. So I, I designed like a small algorithm to figure that out. So you could basically draw any picture you wanted on this coat. I'll probably come back to this one later this year when it gets dark again, because it's just like a really fun project to, uh, to enhance. So yeah, that was a really fun one to do. Uh, next up is QB1. So QB1 is on the, uh, the desk next to me here. If I go to my overhead, um, it's currently running its LiDAR there. So it's got a camera on the front. 
got a Raspberry Pi uh, 4 inside. And um, this one I designed for using with ROS, Robot Operating System. Get back over to the slides there. So, um, so the LiDAR can send out its laser. You can get a map of exactly where you are, like in a location. You can see the room. And um, you can then put that into something like SLAM, simultaneous localization and mapping. And then you can basically build a map um, of your room. So it's really, really advanced stuff. It's kind of on the bleeding edge of my knowledge and uh, my expertise, this. But I designed QB to be the thing that would uh, help me learn more about ROS. So I did a couple of shows on that. And uh, I need to return to that and do the mapping bit because that's the bit I'm missing at the moment. Um, but yeah, it was loads of fun to put together. This one was a, a unique design because I, I started out a lot of my robots. Um, if I just grab this one here, for example, are simply like a, a single plate and everything's sort of attached to it. So this one is a, a mechanism robot that I've designed um, called Rover. And um, yeah, so it's a single sort of plastic piece that's just been designed so that things can screw into it. And I thought, what if I design a square footprint and then some columns that go up and then have it so you can attach and screw in all the different sides and then have a, a shelf for the LiDAR thing so it's sort of separate and high up enough that it's uh, useful. And uh, that's kind of where QB came from. I also wanted to have the, the front-facing uh, camera on there too. So that's uh, that's QB. Again, that's one I'm probably going to return to and uh, enhance. But I'm really pleased with the design of that one. And then we have uh, Bubo. So I've got Bubo here. Just unplug that charger that's been charging up nicely for me. Uh, so I've designed this one for the Maker Fair that's in May this year. So Maker Central in uh, the Birmingham NEC, I think it's the 13th and 14th of May. Um, I wanted to have a companion robot. So. You've probably seen these uh, makers like Alex Glow or Jarvan Moss with a robot that's mounted on their shoulder. And I wanted to design my own. And I love the, the movie Clash of the Titans. Remember Ray Harryhausen had this little uh, clockwork uh, owl. And uh, I wanted to design my own version of this. So this is like a steampunk owl. It's like a sphere shape. And I call it a Bubo Tutti. The Tutti is because it can toot. It can tweet out pictures that it can take. So in this eye here, there's a Raspberry Pi camera and um, I've got some software that's running on the Raspberry, the Raspberry Pi 4 that's inside that can detect um, hand gestures. It uses OpenCV or CV zone to do hand gesture recognition. It can um, take a picture, add a filter to it, add an overlay to it and then tweet that out. So I did a show about exactly how to make this work. Now it's also got two lots of Raspberry Pis in here. It's got the Raspberry Pi 4 and it's also got a, um, um, a is it a Pico in there as well? Oh, servo 2040 from Pimeroni so that we can do all the servo stuff. So if I, uh, which one is it? That one there. If I do this, it'll open its eyes and then start doing some kind of LED stuff. So you can see there it's got the um, NeoPixel rings for its eyes. So that's quite a difficult mechanism to make. So the eye has an eyelid that opens and closes. There's an RGB LED ring around the camera and there's a camera that's mounted in there as well. So there's quite a lot going on in the little eye mechanism. And it's got a little beak that that can open and close as well. So he's just running a piece of code at the moment. And I've just got these nice, uh, there we go. He's gonna close his eyes now as he goes to sleep. You can see the, uh, the servos make quite a bit of sound. Um, and it's a little bit like a Furby, but quite a bit lighter and a lot more intelligent. So this one is absolutely loads of fun to do. I've actually made a second one. Let me just put that one there. I made a second one because uh, Raspberry Pi contacted me and they said that they wanted to display in the Raspberry Pi store in Cambridge. Um, but they've not got back to me exactly when they want to do that. I thought they were going to do that this month during the uh, Cambridge Festival, but I think they might do that later in the year. So um, I actually made a second one, which is just behind me, that yellow one there. I just need to finish that off. Quite a long time to print that one. So, yeah, there's quite a lot of uh, clever technology in there. It was um, going through all the different Python libraries for image um image processing. So I use pillow quite a bit in there. I did actually check out your book on that one, Danny. I think you've got a bit in there about uh, using pillow, was it? <laughs> and uh, yeah, so next up, I've got the uh, Pip Boy. So this one is uh, another Raspberry Pi. This is Raspberry Pi Zero. And this is um, the idea of this. It's like a wrist mounted computer. So you can sort of uh, which way around as we do it that way around. 
So I put this on my arm there. So this one is a wrist mounted computer. If I just plug the power in, you can get this to sort of fire up. And it's got, so it's got a nice Bluetooth uh, keyboard on there so you can uh, do whatever you need to do. It's even got a little breadboard mount there. So you've got a Pico W and a little mini breadboard so you can do kind of experiments on the go. And there's a Pimeroni Hyperpixel 4 display on there too. Um, and um, I just need to put some foam in there so it sort of nicely cushions and uh, sort of rests on my arm correctly. And let me see if that's actually firing up. I think the battery is probably flat on this one, so it's uh, it's probably not going to charge up. But inside there, there's two uh, 18650 batteries, and that powers the the zero. Um, and then the idea with this is I can actually troubleshoot Bubo because I've got terminal to terminal into it via VNC. <laughs> so uh, I, I had to make one of these because just because reasons. Okay, I think we're nearly done, actually. Let me uh, go back to... Yep, so I've got a website, kevsrobots.com, and that's where I write up all my projects. So if you head over to kevsrobots.com, uh, in fact, I can probably bring that up and show you that um, very briefly. I go over to here. So Kev's Robots, I've got... Um, the top there, if you click on Robots and Projects, you can either click on Robots, and you can see all the different robots that I built. And there's a lot more than I've shown you today. Uh, there's there's quite a lot of projects and each one of them has got a full write-up so you can click on it uh, you can read all about um, how to make one you can watch the video about it you can see what the bill of materials is for each of them um, download all the different parts the stl files and give all those away for free i'm a big believer in open source so i'm never going to be rich <laughs> just giving all this stuff away uh, so that's the robots and then there's the ones that are kind of non -pro non-robot projects um, and there's quite a lot of them there, like the Jalapeno 9000, which is the uh, self-watering plant system. Duck Face is the uh, the one that can take the pictures. And you can see there we've got the ghost box. These pie stands are quite useful. There's the eye mechanism as well for uh, for Bubo. I've got some cyber glasses that I designed. I've got the giraffe stand, which is like a camera stand for putting next to your 3D printer and doing time lapses. And got things like the Atari 2600 computer case for the compute module. So if anybody's got the uh, the compute module wondering what to do with it, that's a nice case you can 3D print out for that. And uh, yeah, there's more. So yeah, I think that's probably about my half an hour, is it? <laughs> Let me uh, go back over to that. I think that was pretty much it. Yeah, if you wanted to follow me on social media, I'm at all the places on there. So on TikTok, it's a bit, a bit more for the youth, that one, isn't it? TikTok. Kevin McAleer 6. I'm on uh, Instagram, Kevin McAleer. Twitter is where I mostly hang out at Kev's Mac. And I'm also on Mastodon Social, Kev's Mac at Mastodon Social. Cool. So yeah, that's that's all I've got for you today. <laughs> Unless you want me to carry on talking, I can talk a lot. <laughs> Over to you, Richard. Sounds great. <laughs> if there's some questions in the... Uh... <clears throat> Let's have a look. So let me see what we've got question-wise on here. There's one from Brian. Brian, do you want to ask your question? Uh, yeah, I'm, I've been experimenting a bit with um, Docker as well, and I'm starting to play around with Kubernetes, so the uh, K3S yeah. version, the lightweight one. So is that something you've looked at in terms of kind of automated failover, load balancing, all that kind of thing? Yeah, so I've, I've looked at um, both Docker Swarm, which is the, the built-in version, uh, I've had a little bit more success with that than I have with uh, with KS, uh, with Kubernetes. Um, Kubernetes does require quite a lot of processor and memory usage before you even get to sort of hosting containers on there. Docker is a lot more lightweight, so you can do yeah. a lot more with, uh, with K3S. But um, for me, I learned how to do stuff in Docker first. Uh, and Docker Swarm will let you do all that kind of failover. You can just say how many nodes you want to have replicated and it will just do that magic. The, the only yeah. caveat to that is if you, you have to have them all on the same um, network switch and they have to have pretty quick access to each other. Otherwise, they'll lose the heartbeat and they'll just disconnect. Yeah. And everything will just end up on one server. <laughs> so, yeah, my, my cluster, I've got a, a Pi 4 with 8 gigs and then I've got a, a Pi 0 2 and then yep. an orange fire and they're in a in a cluster and i'm just at the moment it's just playing around with them just yeah yeah they recommend you have and, yeah and i think like, you need at least two gig for the uh the kubernetes so it probably won't, won't run very well on the zero it'll basically just try and swap everything out to the swap file and yeah. just kill your sd card <clears throat> so is, there, yeah. is the pico w now your um your go-to uh, device 
it pretty much is actually yeah so i do an all I've, I've got a lot of them because they're so cheap and they're very affordable very um available as well so i do a lot of projects with them and uh, i do all the videos for pimroni that's why i use a lot of their products because they send me stuff to play with and um so i've got all, all manner of uh, these like screens and things that they uh they send me to do the intro videos on so because of that i, I tend to know their catalog of uh, equipment and they do an awful lot of stuff that just plugs into picos yeah so you're the, the, myself quite useful yeah. so you're the new lady ada <laughs> nearly <laughs> <laughs> um, i wanted to ask you about the uart bridge you referred to between the pico w and your your plasma yeah 2040 that's a piece of hardware, I take it, that UART bridge. No, it's just... I, um, I wondered why you didn't weren't able to um, bitbang it. So I thought the easiest way and the more reliable way to send messages from one device to another was simply just using um, like a UART. Um, mm. Just to send and receive. It's just two pins. And I create... And, and it's something from the... When I used to work with Arduinos and... and sending messages over the UART from there. It was kind of just a follow-on in my mind's eye from that. Um, and it's pretty reliable if you've got them sort of hardwired together. Um, what was the, the, the learning with that? I mean, now you can actually use the um, the plasma stick. So they've got a product that does everything in one now, whereas at the time they didn't have that. So I had to sort of, you could either have the plasma 2040 and no wireless connection, or you could have the Pico W with wireless connection, but it hasn't got all the hardware for doing um, RGB LEDs like it's more the power stuff for them because they draw so much current it would just blow the Pico up so that's what kind of mm. what I've gone I wrote I wrote a little MicroPython library called EasyCom which does all that kind of handshaking and stuff so you can just use that to send messages between the two and you can simply just send like a, a string of text as a command um, or like a JSON object as a command and just take it from there so it's very simple to use yeah right. Not as yeah. fast as maybe bit banging it, but I, I didn't need that. It was more the simplicity. <laughs> um, yeah, I can see that. Yeah, cheers. So how, how's your YouTube channel going? Yeah, not bad. We're, we're nearly at 16,000. I think by the end of the month or just, just uh, into April, we'll probably hit uh, 16,000 uh, followers, subscribers on there. And uh, yeah, it's bringing a little bit of income now, so I can actually uh, buy buy stuff by uh, parts because each one of these projects to do you know isn't free <laughs> i have to buy all the stuff for it so it's kind of a self-sustaining hobby now which is quite good and it's also getting exposure so you know i've been in the magpie magazine a few times and uh, hack space magazine and um, the, um digital photography world reached out because they have um i i did the the camera i've got three cameras behind me on the uh, the shelf there which is which uses the the raspberry pi high quality camera module and um jeff geeling actually picked that one up and he ran with it he actually used my case and did a a, a show on that for the for the new uh, computer uh, camera module three so yeah um, so do you, do you build these things like full time or do you, do you actually have an, another job as well i have a day job so i'm a, I'm a freelance project manager I'm currently working with kellogg um okay. so that's uh, all interesting and fun and uh yeah it's <laughs> A bit like you were alluding to at the beginning of the call. It's a really interesting, fulfilling job, but I also still like doing stuff that's hands-on because project management is quite hands-off. It's a lot of sending yeah. emails and phoning people up and stuff, but but it's um, I've got a degree in computing, and you know it's something I like to sort of go back to all the time and just make stuff. And I was one of these people that would tinker with stuff but never finish anything, and I found that really unsatisfying. So I thought if I do a show every single Sunday. And I have to have something to show people. And if you think robotics is kind of like three, it's like a Venn diagram with three circles. You've got like the electronics part uh, where you can you can learn that. And I'm, I'm still learning electronics. I don't know all the math behind everything yet. I'm still learning stuff there. Then you've got the programming part that overlaps. Um, and this is in your book, Danny. I saw this actually. I was like, he, he does the same thing I know. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, you've got the MicroPython or Python programming elements to it. And that they're, they're not the only languages, but they're the, my sort of favorite go-to languages. And then you've got the physical design, the sort of mechanical structural side of things as well. And the structural side was where I was weakest when I came into this. But because of 3D printers, I can now manufacture anything I can think of um, if I have the skill to sort of manipulate Fusion 360 to build that. 
and it usually takes me about three attempts to make something 3d printed because i always get the tolerances a bit wrong or there's something i just haven't thought of and then when i try and put everything together i'm like there's no there's no cable hole or there's no you know that thing doesn't fit there or that's too weak and it snaps so there's always something that i have to come back to but these are all part of the, the skill set so i find it very fulfilling to do this and i do this every every minute that i'm not doing my regular job <laughs> I'm sort of working on content and then you've got to write up your projects as well so i i did the first year without writing anything up and people would badger me constantly saying can you give me the files can you um you know have you got any more details about the code for that so i've got to upload the code to github i've got to share that i've got to you know add it to kezrobots.com with some pictures with the bill of materials um and it feels more like a complete thing then even if i don't feel it's finished it's finished enough that somebody else can take it and work with it and the proof there is that, you know, Jeff was able to sort of take my STL files, Fusion 360 files, and uh, change it for his own needs. So, yeah. And how, how's it going with the robustness stuff? How robust are your designs? Or do they, do they last yeah. long time? Or are they really... Yeah, Some of them are really... If, if I put enough thought into them, they, they, they last well. Some of them are not great. So I'm trying to think of an example of one that's probably not so great. So one of the projects I'm working on at the moment is um, Twi Twitcher Pie, is it called? Twitcher Pie. And this one is like a, um, this just has one of the little Raspberry Pi camera modules. And this will sort of sit inside this little, it's supposed to look like a pair of binoculars and somebody holding them. And uh, that will fit a Raspberry Pi Zero inside. Now, when I designed this, it really wasn't a very good design. And I designed this about three or four years ago. And the idea was that you could sort of slot the Raspberry Pi or slide it over there. And there's loads of things I hadn't thought of. I didn't like using screws to begin with because you could screw things in, but then they would they would thread and then that'd be it. Uh, and then I discovered captive nuts. So I use captive nuts everywhere now. So BurgerBot is just full of um, M3 screws with captive nuts. So... Um, the captive nut uh, literally just sits on one side of the 3D print there. The screw goes through and it sort of pulls it together really firmly. And you can screw and unscrew that as many times as you like and it doesn't wear out. The only thing you've got to watch though, is just don't over tighten it and crunch the, the parts to nothing. But they're, they're really robust, really easy to sort of take apart and modify. So I try and use them as much as possible now. And uh, I can see that the projects I've done kind of go through different phases. So there's phases where I didn't like using screws and everything was kind of push fit together and that was a bit hit and miss. And then there's a the phase where I discovered screws <laughs> and been able to sort of screw things together. So um, this one has lots of things that are screwed in, uh, but not using captive nuts. It's just like nuts and bolts um, and discovering mechanisms and how, how you can make really complicated mechanisms or really simple mechanisms work really effectively, like this mechanism for the uh, the burger bot, which is the, the pen up and down mechanism with the teeth. So yeah. that was like a really satisfying one to do. So yeah, constantly playing around with different mechanisms. I've got this uh, um, Theo Janssen leg mechanism there. So this one can go on. Uh, if you've got a couple of these together, it sort of walks like a crab. This bit sort of turns, it's difficult to sort of show on the camera, but this bit will turn round and um, the leg will sort of deform and sort of walk along. So yeah, this one is just kind of a proof of concept. And it's, it's too tight. I need to work up that one a little bit. And also just getting the scale of things wrong. If you get things in you and it's too fiddly and too small, uh, that can be like a real difficult thing. The smallest robot that I built is this one here, which is um, Smars Mini. So this has two N20 motors in it. It has the, uh, the Pimroni tiny 2040 in the back so you can just about see that just there and it has um one of these uh l298 n um h bridges and mm. it's also got a laser range finder on the front so there's a little range finder so just about to see that in there um so it can actually detect distance it doesn't grip very well on the uh on the on the carpet or anything really but it does work <laughs> Well, this is the smallest robot that I built so far. I just needs a little battery backpack uh, to go on it. So yeah, that was basically just how small can you make something that will still work, and how fiddly, how good are you at doing soldering and so on. So, yeah. Cool. There's yeah. some questions in the chat there, I think. Um... So 
So tracked vehicles. <laughs> Do I have any experience with tracked vehicles? Let me just get my other camera out here and I can show you. Uh, so this is my wall of SMARS robots. Each of these has got tracks on it. They're all 3D printed tracks. I've got about seven of them all on this uh, wall over here. They've all got different um, features and abilities like that one. Oops. That one in the center there has a camera. It's got an ESP32 camera on the front so you can see where you're going. This one has like a forklift truck um, thing on it. This one is, um, I'll get that to show that one there. That one has a Kitronics um, Pico thing on it. And they're all sort of nine volt. And this one actually has wireless charging on it. Let's grab that from there. That's got like a wireless charging. There we go. Uh, thing inside it. So you can plug a battery in and uh, charge it up wirelessly. Um, start to see there. I go back to the proper overhead there. You can probably see a bit, a bit nicer. So, yeah, right, cool. And what's the difference when you're, when you're building a track vehicle as, as opposed to a wheeled one? Yeah, so you, you can, um, depending on, on the, the motors that you use um, and the board that's driving the motors, they can, they can certainly go over a lot more terrain. They're a lot more forgiving over different terrain than, say, regular wheels. What I have found is these mechanism wheels are like really fussy. If there's any fluff, if you go on the carpet, they basically don't work because they've got these tiny little rollers um, on, on the wheels so it can go sidewards. It's quite a fun little project to do that one. Um, so if I move things out of the way, go to the overhead, I'll probably get this one to uh, press that on there. It'll move around and it'll decide to go sideways. Stop it from going off the edge there and it'll go back. So that's great on a table, but it's not great on any other surface. <laughs> so tracks are great for, um, yeah, for going over stuff that's, uh, you know, a bit more interesting. What I do like about these is they're all 3D printable. So these tracks are all 3D printed and they actually use filament as the, the pivot between the, uh, the different sections. So you just need like 32 of them. Uh, some of them are a bit saggy, some of them are a bit too tight. So you do have to sort of 3D print and adjust the sort of width of the, the pieces to get it just right. But it does mean you can 3D print an entire track robot. These are SMARS robots. So I do have a website, smarsfan.com. That's what I started out uh, doing robots with, SMARS robots. But they're mostly Arduino, Uno based. And uh, they are probing C. So what's a question from Brian about um, cameras, connecting a camera to a Pico, what cameras work? Yeah, so let me just find that question. Do you connect cameras to Pico? So one of the challenges with a Pico is the memory. So it's only got 264K of RAM on there. And if you want to take a single image with a camera, unless that camera is like, you know, 10 pixels by 20 pixels or something color, you're going to run out of RAM really quickly. So what you tend to find is that there'll be like an I squared C device that you can say, take me a picture and save it to this, you know, save it to the file system on the Pico. And the Pico basically just bit bangs the stuff from there without really doing any processing of it. So it's not very good at doing image stuff, the Pico. Now you can get the, the ESP32 camera. That one can do live streaming and everything, but that's in C rather than MicroPython. And they've been able to sort of, again, do some very clever stuff with the with the hardware in there. Now I, I do understand um, Pim Roney are working on a camera uh, as part of their Enviro environment uh, ecosystem, uh, but they haven't brought that out yet. I think they've had a few challenges with either getting hold of the cameras or just making the whole thing work. But they want to make basically make like a a wildlife camera using a Pico. So they announced it back in June last year. So it will come out at some point. So yeah. How are the Picos on uh, on battery then? So they... Yeah, so they're really good on battery. Um, my sort of go-to thing with these, um, similar to what's on this this robot here, uh, I use these um, LiPo batteries from Pimroni, these Galleon batteries. And I also plug that into these um, LiPo Amigo Pro from Pimroni. And it allows you to charge the battery um, through that USB-C connector and also connect that up to your board. So whether it's just like a regular Pico, which is what's which is what's going on on this uh, Wi-Fi scanner, or like a, a you know a, a, another kind of Pico powered board like this one, which is the uh, Motor Twenty Forty from Pimroni. So they've got the 
that, that board has got the fancy encoders onto the wheel, so you can get very accurate positioning um, feedback through those connectors, those proprietary connectors. Yeah. So yeah, I, I did an episode recently, like a very short video, it's about seven minutes long on power, um, how to power your projects. So if people are interested in that, they can check that one out. And it covers like AA batteries, uh, LiPo batteries, solar power, um, all that good stuff. Mm. How to calculate uh, the consumption of your projects. You can basically just ask chat GPT now and it'll, it'll figure all that out for you. <laughs> Cool. Any other questions from anyone? I was going to ask about uh, if you've got some kind of macro pad there. Yeah, yeah. So I've got a few. I've got one I designed myself, and I've got the uh, the professional. So I've got the Stream Deck. I'll just show you. So I've got this one that I use for doing the show, but this is like a professional. You pay about three hundred pounds for one of these. They're very expensive, and they've essentially got like each key is an is an um, LED screen. Um, and then this software to drive that they can animate and all kinds of stuff. So that's pretty expensive. Now, Pimroni do um, got this one. They do a couple of things. They've got these keypads. This is the keybow. So you can get um, um, sixteen keys, and there's a, a, a RP twenty forty inside. So you can plug that in via a cable and have that as like a macro pad. Um, and there is another one which is. I think I've got that somewhere around if not i've got it on the uh, the website i can show you let me find that project there we go a pico deck so if i show you this uh, pico deck that i created so this one is the um it's similar to what you've just seen there but the they're a softer key and i basically just designed this 3d printable stand for it and it has a pico or a pico w in there so you can program it and I basically made each one of these keys do like a macro so you can open up Word or send an email or whatever, take a screenshot, that kind of thing. And uh, th these are quite cheap. They're uh, £18.25 for the board. Uh, that's a better look at the thing. So, yeah, nice. the, thing I, the thing I brought to that was just the, the 3D printable stand <laughs> and the software. It reads a YAML file, so you can configure what you want all the different shortcuts to be, what you want the color buttons to be when they're, when they're pressed or when they're not pressed, and what the actual command that you want to, to make it do. So, yeah, people have really taken these and made things like uh, MIDI drum machines and all kinds of stuff with them. So I, I had to have a go at that as well. <laughs> Sometimes I get these things and I'll just sit there for a while and I'll just think, what could I do with that? That'll, that'll be interesting or novel. <laughs> <laughs> So, cool. The Great. Thanks very much. That was uh, very cool. Lots of uh, still trying to process everything I saw. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So I'll just take um, a short break and then we'll come back and I'll give you an update on my, my scale project. I don't know if many people are interested, but um, I'll just give an update on uh, what I've been doing with this, this uh, working with scales. So uh, five minute break and we'll get back together. Kev, before you go, can I just ask you about um, you, you tend to use the RP2040 or the Pico2040 a lot. Yeah. Can you just talk me through what you like about it? Yeah, that's a great question. So there is um, a lot of people use the ESP in Pico system. And I love Raspberry Pi. I'm a big fan, obviously, as you can tell. And um, and I also like MicroPython. I was using MicroPython on ESP32s before it was really popular, before the Pico came out. And it was a bit awkward to flash it on there. Sometimes you have to get like an Arduino to flash it and so on. But I love that whole, the fact you can run Python on an, embod on an embedded awesome. device. So for me, that anything that can marry those two things together um, so is an easy win for me because... I find Python a lot easier to to work with as a as a language because because it's interpreted. You don't have to wait for half an hour and it compiles everything. You can run it right away. You do have that sort of performance hit, but to be honest, chips are fast enough now that that isn't an issue. So when the when Raspberry Pi brought out the RP twenty forty, um, that obviously came with C and MicroPython and the 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 MicroPython support the number of like tutorials, the number of uh, I squared C devices that are compatible with MicroPython, that's kind of grown exponentially. I would say more so on the RP20 platform than on the ESP platform. Um, 
it, it's because there's only one RP2040 chip at the moment. There isn't like hundreds of different varieties of it, you know, whereas with ESP32, you've got all the different types of that. So that kind of makes it a bit easier because there's just one. And obviously got the, you've got the Raspberry Pi Foundation as well, writing all that educational material for it and, you know, supporting it. It's a great chip. It, does, it can do an awful lot of stuff. And you've got the programmable I.O. I've not even touched the surface of that yet. You can do all kinds of stuff with that. It's almost like having um, an FPGA, like having how many is it? 16 of them, um, as well as your main CPU. You can just offload stuff to them. I mean, they're very simple, but you can do stuff with them. So a lot of the RGB LED stuff uses the PIO, the uh, WS2812 stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I'm a, I am a, a Raspberry Pi fan, but a friend of yeah. mine did get one of the, the RP2040 chips when they first came out, and he was almost... Yeah crying over it so I, I i left that alone so i've been sticking with um really adafruit and circuit python yeah um yeah yeah I so I, I talked to the guys at uh, micropython um so matt trentini and um and damien george obviously the creator of micropython i said what are your thoughts on the fact that it's kind of split and you've got you've got kind of almost three big flavors of micropython now you've got the official micropython that they launch you have circuit python from adafruit and then you have pimroni with their own batteries included pirate branded micropython that works with all their boards and if you think if you create something like like this keyboard it's, it's very specific that the uh, hardware that this has that it interfaces to the chip so they tend to hardware manufacturers will tend to take something and then make it work with their ecosystem so adafruit do loads of different boards um i, I love adafruit i love all the stuff they do um, the you know so they they will create um, I don't know a feather that's got like um, a groove connector on it or something and they'll have other things that work with that and they've got to compile each one of their their devices like a driver to work with that um, like circuit python so it made sense to them to to kind of make it their own and that's kind of what Pimroni have done as well so they've got like the badger the um, uh, e ink display that you can wear as a, a badge. Um, and they made that into like its entire own product in MicroPython. So um, you do get these different flavors of it, but it's all the same stuff. If you know Python, um, it's pretty simple to, to switch between them. And I think they're actually more converging than separating. There's a lot of work to make things that work with CircuitPython work the same with MicroPython. So, yeah. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Marion. Thanks, thanks very much. <clears throat> so I'll just uh, 